Thank you. Being born without arms and doing a lot of public speaking, you run into some real peculiar situations. And being in this room today with all these men and women in uniform remind me of one of those funny situations. A number of years ago, I was speaking for the Defense Logistics Agency in Colorado Springs at a total quality management conference with all top military brass. The MC for the day was a commander of a Triton nuclear submarine, a battle-hardened Navy captain prepared for all types of contingencies. And the room was well set. The sound was optimal, the lighting was bright, and he gets me up on stage and gives me a handheld microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so much for naval intelligence. <clears throat> <laughs> I thought you'd all appreciate that. <laughs> Seeing this guy up here without any arms and these empty sleeves, there's probably a lot of things going through your mind about right now. You may be wondering, how does this guy do it? How does he do the day-to-day -day things in his life that I sometimes have problems doing with my own two hands and ten fingers? The answer to most of those questions that may be going through your mind is that I use my feet for everything that you use your hands for. There's not a special school anywhere in the world that you can go to to learn how to use your feet. It's just that the human body, with the power of the human mind, has an incredible capacity to adapt. I've learned in my life that there really are no unsolvable problems in this world of ours. There just are an awful lot of problems in life that haven't been solved yet. Cheers. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I have had the wonderful privilege for nearly the last 25 years to work all over the world. I have literally worked with everyone from firemen to florists, from politicians to prisoners. Well, okay, that was the same group. <laughs> After all, we are in Illinois. <clears throat> And in all those years of traveling, something interesting happens to me wherever I seem to go in the US. I often get the same question. People want to know what is the correct, proper, sensitive word to describe someone in my situation. I mean, is this a handicap? Is it a disability? Am I physically challenged? Do I have special needs? What is it? Folks, I don't get into the labels, but if you would insist that I give you a word that I think accurately describes my situation, I would have to give you the word condition. See, I've become convinced through my travels that every one of us wrestles with some type of a condition in our life. Well, what's a condition? A condition is simply a basic part of who you are or your job that can sometimes get in your way of living a full, happy, and productive life. That could be something as obvious as being a male versus being a female, old versus being young, poor versus being rich, being single, married, widowed, divorced, those are personal, obvious conditions. Everybody knows that you have them. And then, of course, there are conditions that are deep down inside, and only you know that they exist. Maybe that's wrestling with an addiction. You have professional conditions, budget cuts, increasing regulations. So all of us have some type of a condition in our life, and each of these conditions presents challenges in and of themselves. Obviously, my most apparent condition is the fact that I was born without arms. The doctors don't know why, we still don't know why, and I don't really want to know why because I can't turn back the clock of time. But if you can imagine when I was born, it sent a lot of shockwaves of emotions through my family. My parents were only 27 and 28 years old when they had me. They're from a small town of Breeze, which is just about 30 miles down the road from here. They had three sons already. I was supposed to be their little girl. So I came into the world not a healthy little girl, but instead a sickly disabled baby boy, and their lives were turned upside down. There was guilt, there was anger, there was pity, but most of all, fear. Because now my family had so many questions, staring them in the face, demanding answers, and of course, there were no good ones. 
But somehow, I believe through the grace of God, they pulled together and began to help me adapt to my adversity. The first time they ever saw me doing any kind of physical ad adapting to my condition, I was a toddler sitting at home on the kitchen table, <clears throat> playing with toothpicks. <clears throat> and with my left foot, I picked up a toothpick and I studied it. Of course, at that age, everything goes in the mouth and I licked it. But then I stuck it into a sugar bowl and I rubbed it around and got a lot of sugar on the toothpick. And then I licked the sugar off like a piece of candy. When I was finished, I threw it on the floor. That one gesture gave my family so much hope that I would be able to use my feet for things. And as you can see, I do, whether that's opening a can of soda, pouring a glass of water, getting dressed, typing on a computer, driving a car. My life is a day in and day out challenge of learning what I can do with my feet and learning to live around what I cannot do. <clears throat> I did wear artificial arms for a while as a child, but they were hot, heavy, and cumbersome. And I didn't like to wear them, so I didn't do it for very long. My life has always been this challenge of learning to live around what I can do and what I cannot do. And yes, I'm going to acknowledge to you that there are limitations in the world. I am not some naive motivational speaker who's going to come in here today and tell you to put your chin up and smile and everything is all OK. Believe me, if anybody understands there's limitations in life, it's a guy without arms. I learned a long time ago, even if I had the longest, strongest, toughest pair of arms in the world, there's still only so many things that I could carry or only so much weight I could bear or only so high I could reach. <clears throat> I confront limitations day in and day out. For example, I mentioned to you that I can drive a car. Well, I can drive any car as long as it has automatic transmission and power steering. Here's how it works. My right foot operates the gas and brake. My left foot operates the steering wheel, and it's off I drive. Look, Mom, no hands. <clears throat> Ah, uh, you had to know that joke was going to show up somewhere. <laughs> and that's fantastic. I mean, I could drive all over. But if I get out here on Interstate 64 and have a flat tire, I'm not going anywhere. Or think about this limitation. Let's pretend that just you and I are stranded on some desert island. You suddenly get sick and need CPR from me. You're out of luck. <laughs> I mean, I suppose I could try one of these, breathe, sucker, breathe but I don't think we're going to get anywhere. Are there limits in life? Of course there are limits. The question becomes, what do we do in the midst of our limiting conditions? What do we do in the midst of the limiting conditions? <clears throat> See, I believe our challenge in life, and the reason why I'm here, is to speak of how to help ourselves and to help others live beyond the limits of their conditions to the most maximum capacity that they can possibly do. Today, I'm here to tell you a little bit about how I got started in my work, <clears throat> how it has led to my work now as the executive director of the St. Louis Council of the St. Vincent de Paul Society, which is a, a lay Catholic organization that was founded a number of years ago <clears throat> in Paris, actually, that is dedicated to serving the poor. And I am the executive director of the St. Louis area. Our mission is very simple, just to grow spiritually through service of the poor. And I'll tell you a little bit about that more later. But obviously, an organization, a nonprofit that serves the, the underprivileged or the deprived depends real heavily upon individuals' contributions and donations. So in our development work, one of our mottos is, help us help others. And I think that that is a very poignant statement, but yet it's just a little bit incomplete. Because in my life, I've come to believe that when you help others, you ultimately help yourself. And that's really what I'm driving at here today. As a child growing up in a disability here in southern Illinois in a small town, that was pretty difficult. Life in small town America revolves around sports when you're a kid. And if you don't have arms, you can't participate in basketball or football or baseball, you're kind of left on the sidelines of life. Thankfully, though, as a teenager, I was able to be involved with leadership activities through my church. 
And I participated in these activities quite a bit, whether it was going to dances or going to retreats to learn about developing leadership skills or doing service projects in the community. And over the years through in high school, I eventually kind of developed into a leadership role. I was president of our Southern Illinois organization. And upon my election, a couple of youth and the youth minister and I were given the privilege, the opportunity really, to travel and do a humanitarian mission to the third world nation of Haiti. Haiti, as you know, is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. I believe every teenage American should spend a week in third world poverty. It's a true lesson in gratitude. So at 16 years old, a group of us carted off to Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And of course, you've seen the images of Haiti, especially in the, work, in the wake of the most devastating earthquake. But this was already in the late 80s when we were there, and the country was even a mess back then. On the first day of our missionary tour, we visited Mother Teresa's hospital for children in Port-au-Prince. This was nothing like a conventional hospital. It really just had two rooms, a concrete bunker with a rusty tin roof that sat at the end of a quiet street. We arrived about 8.30 in the morning. The temperature was about 85 degrees. The humidity was very high. And just upon opening up the car door, a warm breeze kicked up the stench of the open sewer. And as I walked into this hospital, <clears throat> the breeze, the sights, and the sounds started snaring the emotions already. I nearly tripped on a baby that was sleeping on a tattered piece of cardboard on a hard, slick concrete floor. And I remember thinking, what is it with these nuns that would let that baby lay there like that? But as I got deeper into the building, I saw that that child was the least of their immediate concerns. The hospital, as I said, is consisted of two rooms, the sick and the very sick. And each room was packed with about 20 to 30 baby beds, cast iron beds, kind of like a scene from a 1930s or 40s orphanage. And each bed was filled with a little sick hunk of life, kids that were just mere skin and bones. There was one window in the room. It was dimly lit. There were flies everywhere. And I could hear coughing and cries of anguish as this one nun administered an IV needle onto the scalp of this child uh, because he didn't have enough muscle tissue in his limbs to support the needle. And I started walking up and down the rows of these baby beds, looking in at these kids with their big brown eyes that just stared off into space. They didn't blink or turn their head to acknowledge my presence. I couldn't tell what they were drugged, delirious, or just didn't care that I was there. <clears throat> and I just started to be overwhelmed with emotion because I, too, knew what it was like to be in a hospital as a child. At two years of age, I spent two weeks at the Shriners Hospital in St. Louis to get fitted for artificial limbs and to receive occupational therapy. And in those days, parents didn't get to spend the nights with their kids. So as a two-year-old, it was a strange place, a lot of poking and prodding, and people running around with white coats using a lot of big words that I didn't understand. Each day, my parents would come and visit me. And at the end of the day, of course, they had to leave. My first memory of life is being restrained by a nurse. <coughs> as mom and dad would drive, get into the family station wagon and drive away. And each day as mom and dad would come back, they'd ask how I was adjusting. The nurses said I was doing fine. But mom knew that that wasn't true because my voice would be more hoarse from crying myself to sleep that night. And I was reliving all of these thoughts and emotions. The anger started coming back and the fear. And suddenly, something grabbed my waist and jerked my mind back into the present moment there in Haiti. And I looked down, and it was a little boy well enough to be getting some exercise. He had his arms locked around my waist, and his big brown eyes looked up at me. And I looked down at him, and I could tell one thing was on his mind. He wanted me to pick him up, and I couldn't. My eyes wanted to well up with tears. I knew that this child had seen so much pain and suffering in his life that he didn't need to see more from me. And I had to do everything, every visceral thing to block those tears from coming. And he just held tighter and tighter. There were other adults and my fellow youth in the perimeter of the room watching this scene going down and no one saying anything, no one knowing what to do. 
And one thought rang in my mind like a bell clanking louder and louder. You don't have the arms to pick him up. You don't have the arms to pick him up. You don't have the arms to pick him up. And I felt totally useless and helpless. We had eight more days in Haiti just like that, visiting leper colonies, people, families with AIDS, families that literally the floors of their homes were formed by trash in the middle of open sewers. But yet my mind always kept going back to that child in that moment. I just couldn't understand why he had come to me. He had to see these empty sleeves and knew that there were no arms. I remember being on the plane going back to Miami, <clears throat> sitting there and getting more and more restless as we got closer to the United States. I knew family and friends would want to talk about the trip and see the pictures, but I wasn't ready to go back. I hadn't yet reconciled this in my mind. I didn't want to stay in Haiti, but I was caught in this emotional limbo. And as the plane got closer, I kept getting more angry and restless and thinking, you know, God, I thought I was disabled when I didn't know if I could get my pants on at 10 years old. And I thought that I was handicapped when I didn't know how I was going to drive a car at 16. But here I am, now nearly 18, and this takes the cake. Something so simple as a child who wants support and help, and you don't even give me the ability to do that. I thought I had God backed into a corner. And I lashed out that you're a cruel God. And I dared him to respond. That's not something you want to do at 35,000 feet. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, the thought hit me like a ton of bricks. The boy didn't want me to pick him up. The boy was hugging me. Something so simple, and I missed it. Preoccupied with my own emotion, my own pain, my own story, and I missed a simple gesture of love by a little impoverished boy who looked past this condition that I had spent so many years trying to get past and touched my heart. Well, I felt like an idiot. I wanted to turn the plane around and go back and let him know that I got it. But just then, the roar of the jet softened, and the plane dipped into Miami. The political situation continued to deteriorate in Haiti over the years, and it wasn't safe to go back. <clears throat> but I was resolved somehow to make that right. I talked to my youth minister, and I said, you know, there's got to be a way we can let other people know about the plight of those living in poverty. We put together a slideshow. We made ourselves available to talk to civic groups and church groups about what we had experienced. And one invitation to speak always led to another invitation to speak. And throughout this, my senior year of high school, we traveled all over the 28 counties of southern Illinois at any whim just to talk about those in need. And throughout the whole year, some 60 speeches later, we raised about $8,000 that we were able to send back to the hospitals and orphanages. But once I had done that, I had stepped into the public light. At this time, self-esteem was a major issue in the classrooms across America. And schools started to ask me to come in and talk about having healthy self-esteem, which I was happy to do. By then, I was in college and needed to declare a major. Since I was communicating, I decided, well, maybe communication was it. So then I decided to go and continue those studies. While in school, at that same Defense Department convention that I mentioned earlier, I met internationally known motivational speaker and author Zig Ziglar, who felt that this story needed to be told further, and he hired me. And I worked for him, eventually started my own company, working all around the world, helping people bridge that gap between the have-nots and the haves. You see, ladies and gentlemen, that's all of us. We all, in some way or another, have things, and there are other things that we don't have, but yet we all feel that gap in our life. And the question is, is how do we bridge it? Well, there's volumes written, and the question still remains unanswered completely. But if I were going to give you one thing that I try to do every day to deal with this, it's to always remain faithful and committed to whatever path it is that you're on. 
Those nuns that I told you about earlier, Mother Teresa's sisters who operated that hospital in Haiti, I've since then done an awful lot of work with them all over the world. They truly run an international organization. 5,000 women strong, 750 facilities around the world, and they do it without a budget. And they don't ask, when, you, when they ask you to pray for them, they don't ask that they get more money. They don't ask that poverty goes away. They don't ask that political systems get straightened out. They simply ask that we pray that they remain faithful. And I think that's all of our task, to remain faithful to whatever it is we do, to, to stay committed, because it is so easy to, get up, to give up in the midst of any type of adversity. So as you leave here today, I urge you to remain faithful and committed to your path. You see, because between the right foot and the left foot, there's this empty, open, naked space. That's called a possibility. You can go right, you can go left, you can go forward, you can go back. But you won't go anywhere unless you step into it. Thank you.